Now it's customary for me to introduce my videos with a little insight or a quote related to the stories that I'm going to read. But tonight, I'm going to make a special shout out to all of the writers who help support this channel by sending their work directly to me. So, long-time listeners, or new-time listeners, I don't know, those of you who've been following me for a while will know that about 90% of what I do are exclusive stories from the subreddit that I set up to uh, facilitate this channel. And it certainly made things more enjoyable for me as I go along, knowing that these people have written these stories with me in mind, and they've entrusted me to do a good job of reading them. Without you, this channel will be a lot more generic and a lot similar to all of the other ones. So, my dear friends, it's Friday. You all deserve to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. It was a dark night, no moon. In a bit on the road today. A returning trip to Brisbane from Sydney on the Inland Highway. Less traffic and fewer speed cameras means two gents can move north in less time. Well, not really. Here's why. It was getting dark. At Tenderfield, we turned right. Casino, 159 kilometers, the site by the road informs. That's 100 miles on the granddad scale. Shouldn't take much longer than two hours. With the hairpin turns, maybe three. We sped off into the night. Through the farmland and on towards Coolangatta for a stopover at Mum's. Our progress slowed not far out of town. The moonless night, the wet and lonely road, and the number of hairpin turns slowed us to a walking pace. Carefully, I followed the black road. No white lines. No street lights. No white posts with red circles to guide my way through the remote bushland. Sandstone cliffs, fallen trees. The wiper blades dancing helplessly against heavy rain. 159 kilometers of hairpin turns on a dark and stormy night. Years ago, on a late night shoot somewhere in Victoria, it was freaking cold. I suppose it would have been, I think to myself. 4 a.m. Must have been minus two. The director sent me up inside this abandoned, run-down, dilapidated sanatorium. He looks over at me. A master craftsman in the use of unusual words. Yeah, this old hospital. I slow the car for tight right turn number 229. Rain thumping the roof like a madman. Yeah, there's this old matron who still patrols the corridors. Phil continues. She's still running the place a hundred years later. The dark knight throws yet another hairpin turn at me. Visibility down to just a few meters. I guide the car into the valley. My job was to keep this wispy white curtain blowing through the window. Joe kept the lights on it in the dark, and the other bloke kept the camera focused. All trying to get this one shot. My concentration divided between the story and the dark road. I went up, set up the curtain and the fan. One great big freaking fan to blow the curtain on a still night. Well, the curtain rod fell and up into the building I went. Again. This time I tied it on with some old wire. Falls again. Up I go again. The fan falls over this time. So up I go once more. And this time, I stayed up there. Curtain doesn't flow right in the wind from the fan, so I lean out the window to hear what the boys are saying downstairs. And maybe this is just all a suggestion. Maybe it's the ghost story. But I get pushed, or I overbalance. And down I go, my fingers gripping the windowsill. The curtain rod falls on me. Bang. I feel myself being pushed again. My concentration high. I'm alert now. And... And so in the end we get the shot. No more than three seconds on film. What? For all that much trouble? <laughs> Films like that. I bring the car around another hairpin turn. My nodding dog moves and I reach into the dashboard to catch it. I also change the clock. Forwards two hours. The camera lets me do that easily. An hour into this leg of our journey. Three by the Camry clock. We 
across a rickety old timber bridge. The planks song and dance as we skip across. The nails flicker, polished by years of wear. Yeah, the show was called Haunted Australia, or something along those lines. Heaps of creepy places at creepy times of the night. Anything else happened? Yeah, they took us to some old stone police station in East Sydney at some stage. <laughs> Lovely spot on the harbour. Into the lower ground with a couple of mediums or ghost hunters or something like that. And I inquire again. Well, they tell me that's the spot where they used to flog the convicts. He turns to me, his face illuminated by the headlights reflecting off the rain. So she, the ghostbuster lady, told us of the convict flogged on that spot. A piece of his soul left behind by the trauma. Blood soaks his clothes, his feet in irons, his wrist bound by rope in a frame that he now hangs from. Phil pauses. They left him there, lifeless, flies in the summer heat. After a few moments of silence, Phil remarks at the lack of other cars. Hey, he hadn't seen another living soul since Tenderfield. Silence. Okay, your turn, Phil encourages. I slow for another bend. This road reminds me of a doko I once saw on Betty and Barney Hill. Phil's silent response indicates an explanation is required. Uh, these two were driving late at night on a lonely road back from Canada, years ago, into that New England area of the U.S., they take a long and lonely road from somewhere to uh, somewhere else. The car slows down for another turn. The rain a little easier now. Well, Betty spots a star that isn't exactly sitting still in the sky. I pause. Barney sees it too. Above and a little forward of their car. No farmhouse lights are visible here. So, Betty thinks it's a shooting star. Barney thinks it's a plane making its way to New York. We might be in a national park or surrounded by a cattle station. Hey, I did feel the jerry can, right? Changing the subject. Phil's attention on me, and not so much on the road now. Hey, try to spot a shed somewhere to keep the rain out of the tank. Huh. Look, the sky is clearing. Pointing upwards. No moon. Not even a house in the distance yet. Just darkness and one lonely star in the sky. Starlight, star bright, Phil begins. And gone again. He looks back at me. His face illuminated by the digital clock. And the star they saw? Well, it develops into a triangular shape. Barney thumbs the pedal to the metal. They shake the triangle and duck up some country lane to hide between some trees. And in the middle of the road in front of them is the flying saucer and a gang of little green men. I pull the car to a stop. Hey, got that brolly? Pop the boot and grab the jerry can. Phil holds the umbrella over me as I fill the tank. A sprinkling of rain drifts to the ground. Just enough illumination from the interior light to see what I'm doing. Hey, just imagine it. They come down here and fill the tank for us. I pause for a moment. Well, with antimatter. I smile. Phil looks around. One single star visible in the sky. Why would there only be one star in the sky? If the clouds were clearing, then... You'd expect the space to be filled with stardust, right? Philip analyzes the situation. Well, it might be a small plane. And I turn back to the tank. Remember that time we went up in John's plane? Phil, thinking about the small plane hypotheses. Uh-huh. Yeah, the barometer dropped and we had to bring the plane down. It started raining like this after that. And... That's not a small plane. No small plane will be in the sky, at night, in the dark and in a low-pressure system. 
Little green men? I joke. Phil's face is void of emotion. The car glides along the road, and we feel a second timber bridge rattle beneath us. Hey, what do you suppose happened to the star? Behind the clouds, I suppose, I reply. I'm not convinced it was a star. Men, men, lights, I suggest. Phil looks at me blank-faced. Maybe the spot the pot chopper. The thick bushland opens up to thinly treed paddocks. The lifeless road before us. The car remains silent. Fewer corners and hairpin bends allow the car to move smoothly. Rain beating on the windscreen. Hey, I put the jerry in the boot, didn't I? I inquire. I don't recall putting it away. I really don't know. The confidence in Phil's voice now gone. I don't even remember getting back in the car. He pauses for a minute. How's the tank? Uh, just under half. Thinking to myself that I wouldn't just leave the jerry can. I must have put it away. And put in its seatbelt to stop it spilling. Even though it's now empty. I don't know about the can. I really don't remember. Just forget the can. Just keep moving. Phil's voice. Soft. Cool and gutter. Tonight. We pass a few more K's. It might have been half an hour when we passed through a small village. Slowing for the change in speed limit. No street lights. No house lights. No dogs or other travellers of the night. I need to stop. A bit squeamish. I slow the car. I open the door and look back at Phil, illuminated by the interior light. His nose bleeding. Hey, you're right there. Yeah, why? He pulls the sunshade down and looks into the little mirror. A thin line of blood beneath his nose. His beard filling with red. Oh, Jesus. He opens the door, and a small pizza appears on the road beneath him. Peas, carrots, and yucky stuff added to his already red beard. Out of the car, I hand a bottle of water to the big man, seated and curled in the fetal position before me, a mess on the black road between us. You're right, I inquire, and he clearly isn't. Here, yeah, water. I hand him the bottle. Is it just me? One minute I'm fine. The next... He pauses. This? A moment longer and he adds. How far to Lismore? I don't know. And you're right. Maybe we'll stop in Lismore and get you into that casualty ward. I pause. Maybe it's not that bad. Just a little nausea. A bleeding nose can be caused by dry weather... Aspirin? Well, a dozen causes. Let's see how you go until we get to Lismore. Phil accelerates. He's trying to change lanes. Other cars don't make space for the impatient driver. He curses the other drivers with bad language. The first rays of the morning sun give the sky a fresh blue hue. Good morning, sir. How long was I out for? Curious, as I must have been asleep since we swapped drivers when I filled up the jerry can. Dunno, but isn't it nice to see the sunrise? Phil adds animation. Years of living amongst Melbourne's Italian community. <laughs> Haven't seen one in years. I count my fingers and count them again. The clock in the Camry reads 7.32. We left Tenderfield at 8 or so. No way is that road 11 hours, even with my two-hour fiddle clock trick. Me, did you stop a while? Nah. I can see he's noticed the same thing. Wow, Bruxner Highway really does add a few hours.
I'd like to tell you a story about my job. Now, I don't normally talk about work because, well, don't bring work home with you, right? Well, I need to share my experience of work last Thursday. But first, some backstory. My name is, well, let's, let's say it's Dom. I'm from a growing but still small Texas town, and I'm the manager of a popular pizza joint that can be found across the nation. Now, at work it can get pretty hectic in the blink of an eye, and sometimes, just sometimes, I am lucky enough to get to take a delivery. I know it doesn't seem like something to be excited about, but trust me, after spending two hours preparing pizza for rude, unsympathetic people, one right after another, you jump at the chance to get out of there. That night, however, was one of those nights you don't want to be out on the road. Rain and wind battered the roof and the windows of the store. The night looked extra dark on the opposite side of the glass. It had been raining for the better half of the day, and it didn't look like it was going to stop. But at 10.30 on the dot, it did, and the fog rolled in. Now, I'm going to change course and give you some background on my hometown. It's an old German and Czech town, and these days it's fully starting to catch up with the times. Just a few years ago, we got a Taco Bell, and the town basically threw a parade. It's a great town, on the surface. Good for visitors to lay their tired heads in many local hotels, some of which are historic. We even have a song by a famous rock band dedicated to us here. Anyways, the town was founded in 1826. There's a lot of history in this little town. We have the ruins of one of Texas's original breweries, so that's cool. Oh, we also maintain the tree that General Santa Ana surrendered Texas to the USA under. But the glamour only goes so far. This town has a dark side. One that the community tried to bury throughout the years, and with good reason. The things this town endures are not for the faint of heart. After the town started growing years ago, a group known as the Freemasons set up shop here. Yeah, you know who they are. Well, the secret society's chapter in my town supposedly dabbled in witchcraft and sacrifices. The kicker, though, is every Thursday, still to this day, they have meetings in an old building towards the edge of town. As if the windows being darkened and the large G insignia painted above the door wasn't enough, there's not one person in town who can tell you of a time they ever saw people go into the building. And yet, every Thursday night, the building's porch light is on, and you can see faint, thin lines of light cracking through the wood blocking the windows. The oddest part of it all, though, seems a bit trivial, but there is never, ever, any cars parked there. Nobody knows what goes on inside, and I don't think most people want to. A few years ago, in a field behind the Mason's Lodge, a city worker found the bodies of three young children while mowing. I say bodies, but it was actually bones that were found. The youngest was identified to be no more than ten months old, and they'd been there for at least fifteen years, according to the forensics investigator who handled the case. Alas, most of the community don't want to even think about the lodge, and so we don't. So. Now that you know the history of my home, here's the next fact. Fog is a terrible omen in my town. Most bad things that happen in this town happen when it gets foggy. Now, you might think it's all a coincidence, and normally I'd agree with you, but it's a regular occurrence that people see things in it. Everybody knows to avoid the fog, to get inside and lock the doors. I've been lucky, living here for 26 years and have never seen or heard anything. But, well, there's a first time for everything. So, back to last Thursday. Other than the weather, it seemed to be a quiet night. I was getting prepared to close down at midnight. I glanced at the clock on the computer screen in front of the store. 9.45pm. My driver, let's call him Jack... Walked in the back door, returning from a delivery. When it rained, we always got more deliveries. I mean, I get it. Nobody wants to go out in this weather. 
The sound of the two-tier pizza oven buzzing in the background made it hard to hear, but I did hear Jack saying something. What? I called towards the back of the store. He slumped around the corner and made his way up to the front. I said, my tire is almost totally flat. I sighed, knowing that if any more runs came in, I would be the one to take them. His truck always gave him trouble. Being a delivery driver can really take a toll on your vehicles. And as if the world knew I was getting ready to close, my order screen went off. Playing That's Amore, which is a tune we use to let us know somebody's placed an order online. I rolled my eyes and looked at the screen. Oh, thank God. A wave of relief washed over me as I saw the small order of wings staring back at me. I hate having large orders come through this time of night, as it always delays us leaving. So, in a hurried fashion, I threw the wings in the oven and got what cleaning done I could in the five minutes it would take the order to finish. Finally, the wings started peeking out of the oven. I grabbed the box for wings and got ready with the giant spatula we used to pull things out of the inferno. Without thinking, I threw them in the box and instinctively doused them in hot sauce. But I had the nagging feeling in my head, telling me to check that I put the right sauce on. And, sure enough, right there in black and white on the tag, barbecue wings. Oh, f I mumbled. I dropped the box on the table, frustrated. On my way back to fix another order, I gave the computer screen a quick glance. 10.15pm. I ran another order through and put in the correct sauce on this time, bagged it up and clocked out on the run. I climbed into my midnight edition 2016 Dodge Ram and cranked the engine. It shattered the sound of the rain on the roof and asphalt with a loud roar. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I backed out of my parking spot by the back door and turned towards the main road. Before pulling out, I scrolled through my music app and found a song to drive to. Cranking my radio up, I pulled out onto the road and got up to cruising speed rather easily. I glanced at the clock. 10.25. The rain had slowed to just barely a drizzle. I wasn't even using my windshield wipers. I was driving deeper into the heart of town. Having crossed the old bridge over the river, I was now in the town square a giant old courthouse residing in the centre of it. Little mom-and-pop shops, bakeries and barbecue joints surrounding the area, all closed by 8pm. The rain stopped as I pulled up to a red light. I took notice that I was the only one on the road. Creepy, but not unusual. I went through the intersection when the light turned green and turned onto North Franklin Street. Glancing at the tag for the house number, I realized just where I was headed, right towards the Mason's Lodge. My heart fluttered a bit. Now, I love horror, but something about that place gave me the creeps. I looked both ways when I came to a four-way intersection, and did what we call here a rolling stop. As I looked up the street, I saw a giant wall of white, and my heart stopped. Fog. I looked at the clock. 10.35pm. The fog was moving fast. I could see it moving through the intersections towards me. I swallowed hard and felt a sigh of relief as I realised I was coming up to the house that had ordered this food. I looked twice to make sure I was at the right house, and once confirmed, I jumped out and hurriedly went around my truck. Throwing open the door and grabbing the order, I speed-walked up to the door and knocked rather loudly, and in quick succession. I leaned back and looked up the street. The fog was coming. It was just a couple of blocks away now. My breath hitched. I raised my fist to knock again, but I heard the deadbolt click and the door flew open. An attractive girl around my age was standing there. Hi, how are you? I said with a smile on my face and in my robotic customer service voice that I use on a daily basis. She nodded, handed me the money, and responded in a low voice. 
You should probably hurry back. Keep the change. Before I could respond, she slammed the door in my face. I heeded her warning and turned to jog back to my truck. Too late, though. As I made my way back to the truck, the fog had overtaken me, and with it came an eerie silence. My heart pounded, and my breath quickened. I immediately felt threatened. I jumped in my truck, and without even putting my seatbelt on, I threw my truck into gear and floored it. Being from town, I knew what streets to take to avoid lights and stop signs. The fog was very thick. Suddenly, even though I was preoccupied, I heard the voice of Ivan Moody from Five Finger Death Punch suddenly cut off. My radio was no longer working. Oh, hell no. I put my foot onto the gas pedal and hauled ass through town. I wasn't worried about police. They wouldn't be out in the fog. Nobody would. And yet, here I was. I turned onto the main road and gave my truck some gas. I knew I was coming up to the bridge. Not that I could see it. I couldn't see more than three or four feet in front of the nose of the truck. But I knew. I took a deep breath and glanced in my rear view. Nothing there but a white wall of fog. I did a quick glance in my side mirrors as I drove onto the old bridge. Nothing. I looked back in front of me and, in a surprised panic, slammed on my brakes. There, in front of me, stood a girl, but not just any girl. The one I'd just taken the delivery to. Only, she was dead. I knew who she was. She stood there, in front of my truck, facing me. Eyes white as snow. Wet, thick blood coming from her ears and nose. There I was, stopped in the middle of the bridge, with only two options. Go back and take the long way round, or go through this girl. Fuck, I said to myself. I slammed my foot into the gas pedal and locked my elbow, ready for impact. I closed my eyes, waiting for the thud, but I felt nothing. I opened my eyes, ready to see the worst, but all I saw was the fog. Now across the bridge, I knew I was almost back to the store. Taking a deep breath, I looked back in my rear view and almost pissed myself. Just behind me, in the bed of my truck, looking at me through my rear view, was an old lady. And, just like the girl on the bridge, she was bleeding from every orifice in her head. I couldn't look away from her. Her eyes were a deep abyss of black, and the blood didn't look red. It looked more like a black ooze up close. I just couldn't look away. Suddenly, in her eyes, I saw a little flash of light. A reflection. I knew what it was. I slammed on my brakes again, and I swear I saw the old lady smile as I skid to a stop just before slamming into a turning cop car. I wasn't sure whether to feel relieved or even more scared. As a stoner, my truck has a very pungent odour to it. Even though I was dry... I didn't want this trouble, but in this situation, I was kind of glad to have run into him. The police officer was now parked in the intersection. His door cracked open, and I shook my head at him. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw nothing but that wall of white fog. I then glanced at the clock. 10.54pm. I then looked back to the cop. He was now walking towards me in my headlights ready to roll my window down. Suddenly, the officer drew his pistol and began looking around, doing a full 360. I watched him in horror. Waiting for the worst, he shot me a look, nodded, and then ran back into his car and peeled out, driving past me and disappearing into the fog towards the bridge. I followed his lead and floored it. Coming up to the intersection that led to my parking lot, 
I flew in without even using my brakes, causing the truck to do a little jump at the entrance. I pulled into my spot with a deep sigh and a few deep breaths. I threw the truck in park, turned it off and put the keys in my pocket. I sighed one more time and threw the door open. I jumped out and slammed the door shut behind me as I ran to the back door. As I plowed through the door, I swear I heard somebody say my name, followed by a spine-chilling chuckle. I slammed the door and locked it. I turned to find Jack standing there, doing dishes, looking at me, surprised at my panic. Welcome back, he said. Without saying a word, I speed walked to the front of the store and flipped the open sign off and locked the doors. Technically, we didn't close for another hour or so, but who the hell cares? Neither me nor my driver were going back out there until it was time to go home. The rest of the night was completely quiet. By the time it was time to go home, the fog had dispersed mostly. Jack and I looked at each other and nodded to let the other know we were leaving. He threw the door open and we hurried out. I grabbed the key to lock the door while Jack guarded my back. I put the correct key in and locked the door. And as I pulled the key out of the lock, we both heard a faint, blood-curdling laugh coming from town where the fog was receding to. We both looked at each other as if we'd read each other's minds, and we took off at a dead sprint for our trucks. We said nothing. We just sped out of the lot and went our separate ways. The rest of the drive home was quiet and clear, even the moon was out. The next day I woke to the sun glaring through my window. I sighed, as everyone does on the day after a foggy night, then checked Facebook for the bad news. The girl I'd taken the delivery to had left a window open. The fog must have gotten to her through it. Her body was found in the hallway between the front door and the kitchen, clutching the box of wings I'd given her the night before. Her eyes were white, and dried blood had come out of all the orifices in her head. I swallowed hard, and kept scrolling through the local news page. I saw the face of the old lady I'd seen in the back of my truck. They found her face down on the concrete in her garage, which she hadn't closed all the way. And, just like the girl, her eyes were milky white, and blood pooled around her head. Now the next picture freaked me out for some reason. It was a picture of the cop car I'd seen. The picture showed a tow truck pulling it out of the river under the bridge. And, to my disgust, if you look close, you could see his hands were still gripping the steering wheel, but were not attached to a body. They haven't found the rest of him yet. I scrolled down my screen and saw a few more unfortunate souls had been caught in the fog. And then, something else caught my eye. It was Jack's truck. The picture showed his truck upside down in the median of the highway, totally mangled. His body was torched to a crisp, according to the article. But nothing else on or around his truck was burned at all. Just him. I'm still having trouble sleeping because of that night. I don't know if it's just in my head, or if I'm really hearing it, but I swear, almost every night before I fall asleep, I hear the faint sound of a blood-curdling laugh. I can't seem to make it stop. I dread going to work every night now. After all, fog is a terrible omen in my town. Well, a couple of stories there, both loosely on the theme of um, strange encounters out on the road at night. Um, quite enjoyed them. Let me know what you think in the uh, comments section below the video, and I promise I'll do my best to get involved in the chat. But crazy busy as always, so apologies now if I don't reply to every single comment. You know how it is. 
even if you don't, well, that's how it is. <laughs> okay, well, I will be back again on Monday. Once again, thanks to everyone for all the support you've shown me. And long may it continue, because I am going to. <laughs> okay, that's enough for me for one night. Sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>